Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to come together to feast upon your word. We just ask that you, the Holy Spirit, would take and guide us into all truth, filter out all the foolishness, and just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. We're in chapter 7. We've been looking at and studying and meditating on the subject of marriage uh, within a Christian context, uh, the relationship between a husband and a wife. And as I pointed out, uh, we are in an epistle in which the Corinthians was a fleshly, carnal church and we've seen the abundance of God's grace poured out upon these Corinthians. These Corinthian believers were faithful in the Lord. They were sanctified. They were made holy. They were made righteous uh, in Christ, uh, made the righteousness of God in Christ. There's nothing that we've seen in the text so far that, would be, uh, that we could possibly misconstrue as being some message to the Corinthians to clean up their act, clean up the flesh, you better start towing the line. You better get busy. You better get things right, make things right, in order to be accepted uh, to God. In order to be acceptable to God, dearly beloved, we've been accepted in the beloved. And aside from the Word of God itself, I don't see how that we could not see marriage, Christian marriage, as probably the most sacred. Uh, thing that there exists on earth today. You know, uh, I think it's a mistake, as I pointed out, to come to this passage in, in the seventh chapter after everything that we've seen and believe that uh, Paul is just addressing the subject of Christian marriage in and of itself, and I, I would never suggest that he's not that this is not teaching concerning Christian marriage and how we're to conduct ourselves within that relationship with an earthly spouse and with our earthly children and so on and so forth. What I have highly stressed and what I have tried to get you people to look at is, is that there's an underlying message and that is the husband is to love his, his wife as Christ loved the church who cared for her, who gave himself for her in order that she may be wholly unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. I think that what we're looking at in the entire chapter from the beginning, I think there's 40 verses uh, uh, in the chapter, 40 or 60, I don't know, there's a lot of verses in this chapter. Chapter 8 is a little shorter chapter. But in this chapter, it, it deals heavily with the subject of marriage. And it's hard, it's difficult, it's practically impossible for me as a, a student of God's Word to come to this passage and look at this as, as having nothing to do with our relationship with Christ. Dearly beloved, I believe that what we're looking at is a picture of our relationship with the Lord and His relationship with us when we look at this picture of Christian marriage and what God Himself has set forth or presented as being the picture of Christian marriage in this life. There's so much that can be said about this. There's so much that could be looked at as a mirrored, it's a mirrored image of our relationship with Christ. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The wife is to be subject unto her husband. Oh, but Steve, that's not, the, that's not the day and age that we live in. And I also suggested that the text does not, absolutely does not, and I, I want to be clear about this, it does not, at least not in my opinion, it does not condemn a woman leaving her husband in that 
or forbid outright just say under no circumstances is a woman ever to, to depart from her husband. Uh, most Bible teachers I've known, most pastors, Bible teachers, good students of the Word have always looked at this, and, and many of the commentators do. They look at this. It's got one big word written all over it, and that's divorce, D-I-V-O-R-C-E. You won't see that term used in the text at all. The wife is not to depart from her husband. Okay, the word is not divorce. The husband is not to leave his wife. Does God not say that He will never leave us nor forsake us? Well, yes, He does. Our lives are a living testimony, dearly beloved. While we're here on earth, to the world, our lives are a witness to the wonder, the beauty, the grace of our relationship with the Lord, and it is pictured in the relationship of a husband and a wife. There's nothing conditional about it. I want to point out, I want to stress a couple of what I believe are really important points here, okay? We have been accepted in the Beloved, not on a conditional basis, not because of we were such a great person. Our spouse does not accept us. We don't, a husband doesn't accept his wife, a wife doesn't accept her husband, or a wife doesn't choose to remain with her husband. Uh, a husband doesn't, uh, uh, is not to put away his wife. There, there is no allowance in the text made for, well, if, there, if by some chance they do something or they, they act in a certain way in which they have, uh, it's where the relationship becomes one of, of law, not grace. I don't know how to put it any simpler than that. It's conditional. Many relationships, marriage relationships today are conditional. I will love you until, I will love you only until or only if, if you do this, then I will remain with you. Or if the husband says to his wife, if you, if you don't do certain things or if, if, you do, if, if you do certain things, then I may put you away. It is just absolutely conditional. And rejection, you know, we're talking about rejection. How, think of folks how harmful rejection is even on a human level. To not be accepted. You know, how can our message, our testimony, be one of grace in which uh, what God has joined together, and this is, the, this is what I find really most interesting, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Well, who joined the, mar the couple together? Well, God did. Uh, and it's interesting to me that modern Christianity will... They don't seem to have any problem when it comes to marriage ceremonies and saying that uh, what God has joined together, let no man separate, and yet after the marriage cer ceremony is over, the next very next message you hear preached from the pulpit is our relationship is conditional. It's based upon merit, human merit, and it's, uh, you know, God will only work in us if we do something. God will only accept us if we are kind of toe the line. And, and God really didn't put us together uh, with Him in, the, in, the, in the, the sense of redemption. Okay, We had a part in it. We played a part in it. It's not the biblical monergism that we know is true. It's, it's a synergistic beginning. We began on a synergistic basis whereby we qualified, we met the conditions whereby we were redeemed. If we, if we didn't do such and such things, we wouldn't be redeemed. What God has joined together, let no man separate. God joined us together with Him in the Spirit. We were born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Now here's something that I don't think many Bible students, students of the Word, will catch as they go through the text. And not, not a lot of focus is ever really placed on the grammar, but we're looking at a passive voice here. Uh, as I've explained in the past, the, I mean, part of, in the part, it's a part of the grammar. You've got active, you've got middle, and you've got passive voice. 
The active voice says that the subject does the action. The passive voice says that the subject was acted upon by some external source. The subject didn't do the action, it was the subject was acted upon. What the text here is, is saying here is that uh, let not the wife depart from her husband, and that's a passive voice. Let not the wife be made to depart. If it wasn't for something making her depart, she wouldn't depart. Now we can go down the list and we can say, well, okay, what is it that, and we can ask ourselves the question, what is it that would make her depart? Well, it's got to be her husband. Her husband uh, put her away. And maybe that's true. We can say the devil did it. Okay, you know, we're good at that. You know, we always want to explain things by, well, the devil made me do it, sort of thing. The devil is not omnipresent. I don't think, I think he's got better things to do, honestly, than to be personally involved in your marriage. Now, I could be wrong about that. There could be, uh, that, that could happen on, I, I suppose, on certain occasions. But then there's a lot of demons that could be involved as well. The question that I had to ask myself was what is it that would cause a woman to depart from her husband? Made her to depart passive voice. Now I'm going to suggest something. I don't agree that anyone believe uh, anything I believe. I've always told you folks don't believe something just because I believe it. I believe that given the context, given everything that we've seen, given our, the fact that our relationship with God is based upon grace, not law, I believe the passive voice is describing a situation in which a woman departs from her husband. She's, she's made to depart, and what, it, what has caused, been the cause of that, making her depart, was law. Legalism. I expected more out of my husband. The relationship was really not unconditional. The relationship was conditional, and he didn't perform the way I thought he, he should, and so now I'm leaving. <clears throat> now, I, I could be wrong about that, uh, but that's how I'm, I'm looking at the text. And the husband is not to divorce his wife. He's not to. Actually, the word is divorce is not there. It is the same word. It is He's not to put away his wife. Now, you can argue and say, well, Steve, that sounds like divorce to me. If you look at the, the word in the Greek, it's just send her away. And if she does depart, she's to remain unmarried, okay, because she is married. Now, that's, that's an interesting uh, phrase there. She's to remain unmarried as if she's unmarried. Well, but, but the text clearly indicates she's not unmarried. If she leaves her husband, she's still married to him and will be until her husband dies, in which she's then free to, to marry another, but only in the Lord. So as, if she's married to another, joined together with another while her husband lives, she shall be called an adulteress. It is not God's best for the woman to depart from her husband. It is not God's best for a husband to take and put away his wife. Why? Why is that? Why did God pick the, this as a picture of our relationship with Him? Because I believe it's because it's so vitally important. It, it's not only our testimony to the world. I mean, we, we are hypocrites. We would be hypocrites if we stood before the, wor the world and, so, and tried to preach to the world that we're saved by grace only to to show that in our relationship with our spouse, it was all based upon uh, something that was not unconditional at all. It was, con in fact, it was conditional. There was, you know, you had to earn, each one had to earn each other's acceptance. Uh, I hope that you can see that in the, in the text as we continue to go down through these, these verses of chapter seven. Let her, the, that is the wife, which I'm, I'm saying represents the church, remain unmarried, not marry another, or be reconciled, reconciled to her husband. Reconciled. 
She's married as long as her husband lives. Well, how long does Christ live? Uh, he's, Christ is eternal. If we go ahead into the next epistle, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, here's what we read in verses 18, 18 through 21. I want to read this to you here. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, we pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. He's talking to believers. He's talking to believers. Of course, they have been reconciled to God as far as God's end of it is concerned, but they may not be living as though uh, the reality of that reconciliation is effective in their lives. And here's the reason. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the reason. Be ye reconciled to God. Now that English version there, it inserts the word ye, which is not in the original text and which gives the wrong impression, you know, as if it were emphatic. Uh, God is reconciled to you, be ye reconciled to God. The, the, the Greek, really what the Greek expresses is, is God was the reconciler in Christ. So, what it's, I believe it's saying is let this reconciliation then have its designed effect. Be reconciled to God. That is, let God reconcile you to Himself. We know righteousness does not, is not based on law. It doesn't come through the law. We know that from Galatians chapter 3. For if a law had been given that was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. Folks, that is why a wife is not to leave her husband. That is why a husband is not to send away his wife. It doesn't jive, for lack of a better expression. It doesn't line up. It doesn't mirror that sacred relationship, that most sacred relationship that we have with Jesus Christ today, the believer in Christ, the body of Christ in Christ, Christ and His bride, the church. Are you getting this? I find it interesting that we're talking about this, which at a, at a point in time in, in our history here in which we may not be here very much longer. And folks, we will stand before God and we will give an account on how we lived our life. Does the Word absolutely forbid the woman from leaving her husband or being made to leave Okay, under any circumstances whatsoever. No, it does not. If that's how you read that, and if that's how you look at that, you're not looking at that hard enough. God has called us to peace. There will be there will be re causes that reasons that cause the woman to depart. But I think really, in and out, the woman is not absolved here. But I think the weight of this is on the husband. Why? Because he's the one that's faithful. Now, I want to mention Jacob and Leah, and I've done this before in the past. If any of us had been back there then uh, and knew J Jacob and Leah and how Jacob tr treated Leah, uh, many of us would have probably advised Leah, just, just leave the lousy sucker, okay? You know, he's no good for you. Leah's devotion was to the Lord first. And this is what we see in our, in our text here. The whole chapter of, of 1 Corinthians 7 here is presenting a picture in which we are to remain in the condition in which we were called. If we were called unmarried, don't be married. Uh, if we're called married, don't, don't get unmarried. It's, we remain in that condition in which we were called. Now, does God forbid us to be married? If, if we were called as a single Christian and we meet a wife, 
uh, is there anything wrong with that? No, we've each received our own gift from God, the text says. But in whatever state we are in, we're to be content and we're to be... It, it's uh, The best way I can exp explain this, I think, is, is just for you to realize that in a marriage relationship, God clearly shows out, He lays out in the text, in this chapter here, what is best, what is better, what is the better thing, okay? And He gives the reason for that. He gives a reason for that. And that is undistracted devotion to the Lord. That's what it is. Because those who are married care for think more, more for the things of the Lord than they, or more for the things of their spouse, they care more about their spouse than they do the Lord. On, on, on how they may please their spouse. Those who are unmarried, clearly they are more un, less undistracted. They're more devoted to how they may please the Lord. That's just the way it is. And example after example after example, I could, you know, we could talk about that, 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 that clearly demonstrates the truth of that fact. Uh, there was a time in my life where I was single, and, and I understood that undistracted devotion to the Lord, but then I got married. My gift was to be married, and I realized soon thereafter that my devotion to the Lord was not first and foremost, at least not all the time. My desire was to please my wife, to take care of her and to love her. Christ loves you, dearly beloved. He died in your place. He died in order that you may have life and life more abundantly. It was not based upon condition. God joined you together with Him. The body of Christ did not uh, come about on its own by accident or by chance. I don't know however many members of, of the body of Christ there are alive today or however many members there have been in the body of Christ up to this date was not was not act by accident that that number whatever they may number was not an accident it was not designed by the individuals themselves us as individuals we did not decide how many members that there uh, of Christ that there were going to be in the body of Christ god joined us together just as in a marriage ceremony what god has joined together let no man separate in fact, uh, the reason it says let no man separate is because you can't be separated. Now, you may be separated physically, but you're not separated spiritually. The woman is bound by law to her husband as long as her husband is alive. That's Romans chapter 7. And if she remarries, well, then she's to be called an adulteress. She's to remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and that is our ministry. Folks, that's our very ministry, is that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. I want to take a moment just to thank all of you for all of your continued uh, interest in this channel, your participation in these studies, these verse-by-verse -verse studies, all the comments, the messages that you send me, that you leave me. I know many of you don't hear back from me, but I want you to understand that I read every single one and that those comments and those, those words, those kind words of encouragement go a long way in strengthening me and encouraging me. Uh, you, you folks mean the world to me. I hope that we're going home soon. I, I, I believe that June 1st, uh, June uh, 6th, uh, June uh, 8th or June 9, and June 14 are high watch days, uh, given the, the fact that they are. We're looking at Pentecost. We're looking at uh, uh, we're looking at the uh, uh, as far as as June. I believe June 9 is concerned. That's Creation Day one, and then of course Adam created June 14. This is all according to Torah calendar. We're looking at the 6,000 years ending. Uh, in my opinion, I want to, I just want to put this out here. I don't know if I have or not. In my opinion, the, the, the 80 years of the fig tree generation, if, if you look at that from the beginning of Israel's rebirth in 1948, 
to uh, the return of Jesus Christ, 80 years, it's expired. It's expired. In other words, if the Lord came today, He would not return until 25, 50 days later, in which He would return. I'm talking about the second coming. He would return on a date in which Israel went beyond 81. It had turned 81, so it's 81 years, a month, and five days, Some, you know, for example. That's... And uh, it could be that the beginning of that, it was not May 14, 1948. It could be that it was the beginning of that was uh, in 1949 when the Neset, uh, the, the Jewish Israeli government was formed. So we could be looking at a year, uh, discrep year off there. Uh, but we've also got Feast of Trumpets, which uh, 25, 50 days later, amazingly, come, he, he would return on the Day of Atonement. If he returns uh, on the Day of Atonement in 2029, you back up 25, 50 days, then it's, we're looking at the Feast of Trumpets this fall. I've always personally thought that it was in spring. I don't know. Uh, none of us do. But we just, we keep looking up, we keep encouraging one another as that day draws near. This here is Choctaw. He's a horse that I'm training, and I gave him the name Choctaw. He didn't really have a, an official name. So I gave him the name Choctaw because I wanted to honor his ancestors. I live in Choctaw country. And so I'm involved in the process of training this horse. And as many of you would probably agree, positive reinforcement is probably the best way to go about that. The same with raising your kids, okay? If, you, if children are raised in a negative atmosphere where that they have to perform in order to, to gain the, their uh, parents' approval, then I think we're going in the wrong direction. And the same is true with husband and wife. Uh, the same is true with uh, uh, animals. Um, but especially our spouse. You know, positive reinforcement is something that I would say almost sums up the entire Christian experience. As far as our relationship with God and as far as how God views us in Christ, having been accepted in the Beloved, you can't look at that as, at, as anything other than positive reinforcement. I would never beat a horse into submission. I'd never take him out to the river like maybe the Indians used to do. If, if you want to try to keep him from bucking, all you got to do is take him out into the river where he's chest deep in water, shoulder deep in water, and it's kind of hard for a horse to buck. Or, you know, if he does buck and throw you off, then you're, you get mad at him. Uh, I'm determined never to ever get mad at Choctaw for anything ever at any time whatsoever, okay? Positive reinforcement. Uh, I expect that the way that Jacob treated Leah, uh, there were many cases in which Leah probably uh, did the unexpected when it came to Jacob. You know, he comp she complimented Jacob. She, now I could be wrong about that, but her her attitude, her mindset was not one of, well. Jacob, unless Jacob treats me like I should be treated, then I'm out of here. And as a result of, Jacob, of Leah staying with Jacob, then the Messiah came through her lineage. God blessed her. God will bless a marriage, a Christian marriage, if it is in line with, in sync with, a mirrored image of, as a testimony to, His relationship with us, the church or that God has nothing against us. Folk, dearly beloved, listen to me. No expectations, no disappointment, okay? I don't have any expectations of my children. Now that may, now, that may sound wrong, 
but I don't have any expectations of my children or my grandchildren. I don't have any expectations of my animals. I don't have any expectations of you. I don't have any expectations. Uh, in, we got to be careful here. We don't have any expectations of God uh, as far as, you know, uh, you know, he's this sort of a genie in a bottle that if we rub, rub it just right, we'll get what we want. No expectations, no disappointment. I love you all, truly I do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.